You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 4, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, contact dermatitis. Our presenter is Dr. Sharon Jacob. She's a professor of dermatology at Loma Linda University, clinical professor of medicine and pediatrics at the University of California in Riverside, and founder and CEO of the Dermatitis Academy. Um, so I'm Sarah Jacob. Um, I wear a couple of different hats. Um, I, I am actually a professor at three different universities. It's an uh, interesting life. So I'm a, a professor at Loma Linda uh, University. I am a cl- clinical professor of med peds at UCR. They've just started a new medical school, so I'm involved with that. And I'm also still on faculty at my alma mater, uh, University of Miami. Uh, on the side, I also I have a company called the Dermatitis Academy, uh, which I personally fund. Um, it is uh, working towards a nonprofit, nonprofit status, but what it is is a education website that's freely available to anyone who has questions. I was getting, uh, I'm not kidding, four to 500 emails a day with the same questions over and over. So what I did was I put all the answers onto the website and I've dramatically decreased the amount of time I'm having to spend on the internet. Last month we had 207,000 hits. 31,000 were from China. Oh, oh wow. I know. <laughs> I know, I'm not telling anything either. It's crazy. So um, that, that was my disclosure. So what we're going to talk to, about today is contact dermatitis, basically the nuts and bolts. Um, I did take on a lot in this new lecture. Um, this is based on the chapter um, that I'll get to at the end, um, but uh, that we go through in our in our residency program from Bologna. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that there's extra slides in there for anybody who wants a deeper dive. So contact dermatitis is an outside-in um, basic concept where something touches your epidermis and you absorb some of those chemicals and either they irritate the skin or they cause an immune reaction. Usually we see a sharply demarcated eczematous looking um, area. Uh, the, it can be pruritic and that kind of goes along with the allergic components or it can have a burning sensation which is the 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 damage to the skin the irritancy um, it can become recalcitrant um, and it can uh, actually expand uh, to other areas if it is an allergic type just for the overview um, about 80 percent is irritant in nature of the contact dermatitis group and about 20 percent is allergic um, there's some other uh, types, which would be your protein contact dermatitis, your systemic contact dermatitis, your um, urticarial contact dermatitis, where you have a type 1 and a type 4 at the same time, um, but, and that's uh, called the contact urticarial syndrome. Um, but those are such a small percent, they're, they're not listed here. They are um, clinically relevant. So when we look at irritant contact dermatitis versus allergic contact dermatitis, there's some basic uh, parameters that we need to think of. If we think of irritant as toxic, um, a toxic reaction where we damage the bricks, so to speak, in the brick and mortar model of the skin, uh, it's dose dependent. Now dose could be a high concentration or a high frequency. So you can get an irritant contact dermatitis from something that's not considered an irritant like a, a, a gentle soap, but if you use it enough times, your, your dose would be uh, elevated enough to cause irritation. Prior exposure is not required with an irritant contact dermatitis, and again, it's either a high dose or a chronically applied. There's no adaptive immune response in irritant, and you usually don't see spread to other areas because it is not an immune reaction. It's Uh, specifically direct uh, contact and direct damage. Allergic, however, is usually not dose dependent. In fact, the more your immune system is revved up or activated, smaller amounts of the chemical can cause a larger reaction, which is hard for patients to understand because they're like, I I cut all four of the five things out that you said, but I'm still reacting. Um, Prior exposure is required with allergic contact dermatitis because there's a sensitization phase um, and an elicitation phase. 
Uh, exposure is usually low concentration over time, high, high or routine and regular frequency. There is activation of the adaptive immune system and you do get spread to other areas. So again, irritant contact is localized uh, to the site that the contactant has come in contact with and you get a, cyt a cytologic effect. And you do get an inflammatory response, but it's not immunologic in nature. There's penetration through the permeability barrier, which is the bricks and mortar uh, model of the skin. The keratinocytes get damaged, and the keratinocytes themselves will um, release mediators of inflammation, such as TNF-alpha, IL-6, and ILB, IL interleukin-1b. They also upregulate the ICAM pathway. There's um, several different types of irritant contact dermatitis. We think of the acute, which most patients can detect themselves because they get the reaction 12 hours after, say, bleaching the bathroom where they got splashed. There's a cumulative type of uh, ICD, which is more difficult because they don't realize that that soap they've been using for the last five years, but they're going higher frequency um, because they feel their skin's not clean because it's reactive, that that is part of the problem. Uh, there can be a component of ICD in asteotic dermatitis and eczema crackle. We often see that on the extremities. Uh, there's a pustular acneiform form, a frictional form, and again, acute um, irritant uh, from the weaker irritants, such as low-grade low surfactants. So these are some examples of irritant contact dermatitis. Um, it usually develops um, due to a direct contact with the allergen. Um, I did, ha uh, sorry, with the irritant. I did see uh, a resident sent me a photo, and he uh, had uh, blisters on his left hand. He sent it to me over the weekend and said, hey, I got this. I didn't have it yesterday, and I looked at it. And it looked like droplets. And I said, hey, were you bleaching the bathroom? And he wrote back and he says, how do you have your glass ball? So um, I don't have some magical thing, but it just seemed it was his left hand. He was pouring with the right and um, it was able to guess, guess well. Again, you'll get sy symptoms of burning, stinging, and soreness. You can get just redness, but when it's a stronger irritant reaction, you'll see edema, bulla, and sometimes um, necrosis. Remember, on a patch test, you can see an irritant reaction, and once you stop putting the irritant on the skin, for example, the formaldehyde that's in the patch, so when you take it down, you'll see it, an irritation reaction, but the, it's not continuing to be exposed to that. So by the 96-hour reading, for example, the irritant reaction will be getting better, so you'll de see a decrescendo phenomenon. Um, this is just talking to more of the ICD uh, subtypes, uh, the acute delayed irritant from the weaker irritants. It's usually not seen till at least 24 hours after um, exposure. Um, Benzochloride chloride is one of the ones we see quite a bit, especially in wipes um, for babies for uh, and hands so and face. So we'll see um, people will use the wet wipes on their children. We'll see hands, face, and uh, the butt area um, the, uh, because they're using the wipes there. Uh, you can also get uh, irritant contact from uh, wet work, uh, from having hands in water. We see this um, also in metal workers, hairdressers, and caterers who are chronically washing their hands. Cumulative, this is where multiple uh, subthreshold insults uh, occur to the barrier. Uh, the barrier has insufficient time to restore, so you start to see this red crackle type look. Um, sometimes they'll report really low-grade pruritus and a, and, and a pain sensation. Um, they will scratch these, and you'll often see linear um, excoriations through, through the plaques. And it's, a, and it's more of a generalized look. It's not so discreet in the, um, in the morphology. Here's a type of uh, ICD subtype, which is called pustular acneiform. We actually see this from people using TARS. Uh, we see it in metal workers. Um, we do see it in people who are using mineral oils. Uh, chloracne does fit under this same category. We also see an airborne type of irritant contact, and this can be difficult to uh, distinguish from photoallergic reactions. Um, airborne ICD, I saw quite a bit in Miami where people would be cleaning their boats uh, with either a Windex and it would blow in their face while they were doing it, and we would see that. So that, that was, um, and oftentimes it, it would be 
their dominant hand that would see the reaction because they were spraying and their face. So we'd see if they're right-handed, one hand and, um, and face. And then frictional ICD uh, is a, re a real thing. I do see that with truck drivers who are chronically driving. Um, and you'll see a specific sparing zone like this, uh, this hand here where the steering wheel, uh, where they're in contact, um, is actually spared, but the frictional point around that is, is where you see the reaction. So barrier compromise is a risk factor for developing both irritant and allergic dermatitis. So we see this in, especially in infants, elderly, and atopics, especially in conditions where we have low ceramides, which is the, uh, the mortar chemicals, uh, mortar component of the brick and mortar model for the skin. Low ambient humidity, cold, um, can also lead to cracking and increased permeation um, of the skin by water-soluble agents, which uh, it, a lot of the irritants um, are able to access into deeper component of the skin this way and cause a problem. So these are some irritants, um, just so that you have um, a list. I'm not going to read all of these, but your top ones are going to be your disinfectants, uh, your detergents, your alcohols, and your water. So these, again, I'm not going to read through it, but what I, one of the most important points here is that regardless of what work you do, uh, wet work and detergents will put you at high risk for irritant dermatitis. So making sure people are using gloves. I have a high number of people who don't wear gloves when doing the dishes. Remember that the dishwashing solution or the liquid is actually made for stripping uh, ceramics and, and metals so to get the pots clean. So it definitely is not something we want on our hands. Also, we can see irritants from uh, caterpillars. I more often see this in children than I do in our uh, adult population. Uh, we also see it um, from bodily fluids, such as urine and feces, and um, also uh, from saliva. So lip leaking dermatitis is something we see a lot in our pediatric population and our elderly patients. And then I added in at the end of this lecture, I know we haven't covered it before, but um, I added in some plant um, uh, uh, information just because I think we see it more often than we realize. Um, and uh, one of the ones we actually see uh, quite often is dandelions in our atopics. So I just wanted to make sure we were, were adding some plant information into this one. Again, uh, the risk is going to be uh, the, the barrier is not intact. Um, remember, some irritants can also act as allergens. So once they've irritated the skin, they get to the deeper component, and then they are recognized by the immune system. So our top irritants that are also allergens are our fragrances, propylene glycol, cocamidopropyl betaine, formaldehyde, and benzoconium chloride. Now, cocamidopropyl betaine has actually caused so much irritant dermatitis, low grade, hard to see because it's chronic, uh, irritant dermatitis in, a, or in our atopic children, and then a subsequent allergic contact that some providers nationally, like Don Belcito, actually says no atopics should uh, be exposed to this chemical. So it's one of his uh, uh, avoidance, preemptive avoidance al uh, allergens. So here we see the difference between an allergic contact and an irritant. On the left, we have allergic contact. You see that the uh, sweat has caused the, um, the perspiration, has caused the uh, deodorant to uh, become dependent, and we see where that exposure is. Whereas with the irritant, it's where the, uh, the, the spray for the antiperspirant was directly sprayed on the skin. Here's an example of uh, allergic contact dermatitis um, from a lipstick on the left. Although we do see irritant contact dermatitis to lip plumpers, they will add some pepper extracts and some other irritants, some salicylates um, um, also, which can act as a sunscreen, but they can also uh, it cause the lips to swell and give you a fuller appearance. So on the left, we actually see the allergic uh, allergic contact dermatitis from a lipstick, and on the right we see lip-licking dermatitis.
Here's some examples of allergic contact dermatitis. There is effacement of the vermilion border and extension beyond. Uh, that's one aspect that can help you determine allergic versus irritant. And this is an allergic reaction to a black henna tattoo, which contains paraphenylene diamine as an additive on the bottom. So now we're going to switch to allergic contact dermatitis. This is a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reaction. It's a specific reaction to an allergen. However, what makes this complicated, and I have a, a patient that was in patch testing this week, is there are some uh, components that will cross-react. For example, my patient this week has uh, generalized dermatitis. She's very, very, very itchy. We patch tested her, and she came up positive to her paraphenylene diamine. Now, she has not dyed her hair for 10 years because she was having such an extreme reaction to the hair dye. However, she's on hydrochlorothiazide, and she's also on hydroxazine, which had the green dye. Um, so we are taking her off, and those cross-react with PPD. We're, having, we're taking her off the, the green hydroxazine, switching her over to the white cetirazine, um, and we are also um, having her primary change her um, blood pressure medication to see if we can resolve her dermatitis. I've had uh, about three or four uh, hydrochlorothiazide patients that were PPD allergic over the last 18 years. Um, ACD requires prior sensitization. You have an initial contact, uh, then you are sensitized, you prime your T cells, um, and this can obviously with a low concentration of the allergen, but the continued uh, exposure to the allergen leads to cytokine release and the acquisition of memory, uh, which leads to an eczematous dermatitis with enough source exposures. Usually the allergens um, are low molecular weight. There's over 3,000 that are known to cause allergic contact dermatitis. Many of them are lipid soluble, which allows them access to a deeper component of the, um, of the skin. Um, and again, a low concentration can be required for elicitation because each time uh, you see the chemical, you have a greater memory to that chemical, so you're more reactive. So this is just a nice diagram from the Bologna book that just shows um, how the um, allergen is coming into the skin, uh, getting into where the keratinocytes are, the keratinocytes uh, sending out cytokines, which activate the dendritic cells, uh, which take up the allergen, take it back to the lymph node, educate their T cells, and then the T cells circulate through and um, look to the uh, sites of primary contact. So I think of it like a diverse flag, and uh, you, the when the a dendritic cell leaves that portal of the skin, it puts a marker, and when it gets to the the, the lymph node and the, the T cells get activated and they go back into the immune system and they're rolling through the blood vessels, they roll into that marker and they know that that is the point that they're supposed to transpedise the skin. So they hit that marker and they say, oh yeah, this is where we're supposed to look and they go up into the skin and look. But they will home back to their initial site uh, routinely. So this is the elicitation phase where the um, antigen is uh, put on the skin, the keratinocytes activate, they, it causes the T cells to come back to the skin, they're, home, they're homed back like a bee, for example, to the hive, and then we see inflammation. On histology, we will actually see spongiosis. You will see little bridges between the T cells because of the fluid that is, um, I don't know why this isn't showing up here. It's actually in blue, unfortunately. But there is a mnemonic uh, for the different types of um, of, of skin uh, specific uh, spongiotic dermatitis that has eosinophils. I don't know why that's not showing up. I apologize for that. It's uh, a mnemonic with the happy fire department is actually the um, the first letter of each of the um, of the names in the uh, algorithm. So let me just make sure um, to tell you what those all are here. 
So uh, one of them would, the H would stand for herpes gestationis. The A stands for ACD and arthropod. The two Ps stand for pemphigus pemphigoid overlap and parasite. The I stands for incontinentia pigmenti. And the E in the happy stands for erythema toxic toxicorum neonatorum. Um, the F stands for fungus, and the D is drug reaction. I'll make sure that the slides that you have don't have those in blue. Oh, that, that's why they came up. They were grayed out. Sorry about that. With increased um, allergen recall to the site, you'll actually get intradermal vesiculation, and that's why we see microvesiculation and, and sometimes bulla. Um, it's important to know the difference between a cross-reactivity and a co-reactivity. Um, in a cross-reactivity, there's similar chemical structure. For example, the paraphenylene diamine and the dye that's in hydroxyzine, for example. Whereas a co-reactivity would be, um, or, or gentamicin and neomycin, aminoglycosides would be another cross-reactivity. Co-reactivity, on the other hand, is when two chemicals have distinct structures, however, they're frequently used together. For example, cobalt and nickel are co-sensitizers, and bacitracin and neomycin are co-sensitizers. In terms of allergic um, dermatitis or allergic contact, remember that the rash initially is localized to the site of contact, but it may spread to other areas in contrast to the irritant contact dermatitis. We also see id reactions, idiopathic response, which is also known as auto and that's because those T cells that are circulating back looking for their homing site may actually transpedise the skin at a different site and set up a colony. So unfortunately, they will reactivate in areas that were not initially sensitized and may not be the area where they have actually seen the chemical. Here's an example of, of id reaction to poison ivy. So you've got a brisk immune response, and the T cells are um, rapidly going in multiple directions to see if they can find the chemical. Um, these are two examples of um, extended dermatitis from multiple allergens at the same time. Uh, the lady on, on the left um, has four different components that um, we would evaluate for, the neosporin, the mastosol, the sutures, and the anesthetics. Remember when you're testing a suture, uh, you actually sew it into the skin and wait seven days to see if you react. If you just put the suture on the skin, you'll 99.9% .9 of the time get a negative. And this is a response to toilet seat. At this point, we don't know if it's irritant or allergic um, because of the distribution, but the fact that it does have the medial gluteal fold um, being um, activated, this highly suggests allergic over irritant because irritant wouldn't extend. Occupations at risk for allergic contact dermatitis. I won't read this slide, but just so you have the information, there's uh, the, the working type is on the left, and the risk factor or source allergen is on the right. For example, cashiers have a high reactivity to nickel and also to formaldehyde due to the paper component in the linens used for the, the um, paper uh, money. So when we're doing patch testing for allergens, historically there was an uh, American Academy of Dermatology had worked with a Hermal company to come up with a 20 allergen kit, which is no longer available. There is a currently available kit called the True Test. That's a commercially available kit that's approved for six years old and, and over. It has three panels. It has 35 allergens and one uh, negative control on it. The North American Contact Derm Group is a research group that each year uh, works with the Europeans to uh, generate a baseline screen of 65 allergens for research purposes and tracks um, source exposures over time. The American Contact Dermatitis Society is a professional society that people can be a member of, whereas the uh, North American Contact Derm Group has a roster of 13 dermatologists, and when one retires, they uh, bring on a new one. 
The American Contact Derm Society, however, is a professional organization that's open to allergists, dermatologists, and pediatricians. Um, we also a family practice. We also have um, a nice resident and fellow uh, program that um, is, is we encourage our fellows to join as well. They have a core allergen series that is the top. 80. And rather than being a research component, they use the data from the other resources and come up with the top 80 that's most likely relevant that year. So people have, it's more of a clinical uh, testing base. So these are the 35 allergens that are FDA approved. But remember, there's three to 4,000 chemicals that we're exposed to in our daily lives. But these are the ones that are either from the Hermol kit or the true test kit, and these ones are specifically FDA approved. So with patch testing um, technique, you want to make sure you're using a clean, dry, non-dermatitic uh, surface. Hair-free area is best. Usually I have the patients shave at home the day before so they don't have razor burn um, and irritant dermatitis under their patch tests. Usually we use the back, however, if there's not enough placement area there, we can use the inner arms as well. We just need to make sure we don't use an area where uh, they've had sun exposure because the UV light damages the dendritic cells and we can get a false negative if somebody's on UV therapy or has had a tan. Once placed, we need to keep these dry. Uh, we keep them in place for uh, 48 hours for anybody 8 and over. For 8 and under, I do a 24-hour wear time with still the uh, delayed readings. We want no topical steroids to the test site for a week and no systemic steroids for about two weeks if possible. That said, I have transplant patients, I have patients with rheumatoid arthritis who are on steroids uh, chronically. If you, my justification or rationalization is that if you have the rash while you're on the steroids, um, I will probably be able to get a low grade positive on your patch test. However, we don't want somebody newly on steroids that has mitigated their uh, contact dermatitis reaction because it will likely lead to a 50% uh, miss rate on the, uh, on the uh, patch test. So prednisone 20 milligrams can cause 50% extinguish, extinguishing of the reactions. Uh, sometimes we can see a 1 plus where we would have had a 2 or a 3 plus, and sometimes it would have been a 1 plus, so we miss it altogether. Generalized topical steroids can have the same clinical effects. So during patch testing, I have the patients pick the worst sites to continue applying their steroids to. Uh, I have them continue their antihistamines as this does not affect the outcome unless I'm testing for contact ur urticaria. If I'm testing for contact urticaria, I do a TAC test at 30 minutes and I ask the patient if they're feeling itchy under the patch. I then remove the patch to the side, keeping one side um, adhered uh, with the adhesive still attached, and look to see if they have an urtication response. Then I put the patch test back and I look for the delayed response in the same well on the patient. So we do a read at 48 hours for the adults and children over 8. We do a reading at 24 hours for the children under 8. Uh, we do a second read at 72 hours to a week. Uh, we do see delayed responses to corticosteroids. Um, we see them to formaldehyde releasing preservatives and also to neomycin. That's because neomycin is a prodrug that is metabolized on the skin to become the allergen. Um, so we often will have the patient come back, um, but these days we're actually um, taking photographs of the patient on their device um, on the day we put the patches on, the day we take the patches off, and then they take pictures and send them to us uh, if anything comes up after a week. We have had two, um, actually three cases now of the steroid response coming up after three weeks. It's important to distinguish irritant from allergic. The common irritants that can be seen on patch testing are nickel, some of the rubber uh, accelerators, the metals like chromium, uh, cobalt can do it as well, glutaraldehyde, formaldehyde, and cochamethyl propyl betaine. 
it's important to recognize that many of our allergens are at their uh, very near their irritant threshold. That's because um, we want to make sure we stay under the irritant threshold, but we also want to make sure we don't sensitize the patient. And again, remember if um, we do see an irritant reaction, it usually decreases in severity the more further out you go on the read. So our different types of reading are a negative reaction, a plus minus or doubtful macular erythema. Now these can still be relevant, especially if the patient's dermatitis gets worse when the patch test is applied because they can get recalled to the primary site. So if on Wednesday, I put them on on Monday and on Wednesday they're like, my hands are completely blistered. I actually become quite assertive and have them use a high potency steroid on their hands to try to chase out those T-cells and make sure we are uh, getting appropriate response on their patch test sites. You can get a 1 plus reaction, 2 plus, 3 plus, and an irritant reaction. So here's some examples of a 1 plus, 2 plus, and 3 plus. This is off online from a the, the uh, commercially available kit. Uh, so here's the kit on the left, and then on the right is uh, comprehensive patch testing. So you can either use fin chambers, which are the aluminum ones. You can use the uh, chemo uh, technique um, plastic ones that have the wells, or you can use IQ chambers, which are also plastic. I tend to prefer the square ones because when I see a square on the patient's back, it says to me this is an outside-in event. If I see a circle, sometimes I'm wondering if it's an activated dermatitis. The skin doesn't make squares when it's uh, um, having an a, a inflammatory response. So remember, it's important to always patch test the patient's personal products. Now, I told, uh, I've become more, more savvy in the years, but in my first year of practice, I told patients to bring in whatever they're using. And I was in Miami, and a VIP came in with their doorman and their chef. And each one brought in an entire suitcase of products. So I said, she, she, she said she wanted to be tested for everything. And she literally had hundreds of things with her. So I told her, I said, well, we've got to narrow this down. Let's see the ones you use every day. And she said, my life is a full-time job. I use everything in these cases every day. And I was just beyond myself because some of the things were, I, I don't even know where she got them. So uh, we picked her top things that had the same chemicals in them that we were testing for on her um, standard test and also panel allergens to increase the likelihood of detecting a positive. We also did test her for, she spent $2,000 on an essential oils kit, which had all these different things that you were supposed to do, a mixing, and so we did test some of those on her as well and found some uh, very uh, good relevant allergens. So with the leave-on products such as makeup, lotions, and creams, you put it on as is. Now for um, hairspray, perfume, nail polish, and mascara, those I actually have the um, do a dry first because, um, so I'll put the perfume on the patch test, let it dry, and then put it on the skin. Same with the nail polish and the hairspray. Hairspray, nail polish, and mascara are actually not meant for on the skin. They're meant for um, hair, nails, and uh, hair and nails. So when they do get onto the skin, they're usually in a dry fashion. The thing with the perfume is if I put it on direct, I will usually get an irritant dermatitis because it's not used to being applied under occlusion. So that is why I dry it first. It's important that the products that are used in rinse off fashion, for example, uh, cleansers, soaps, shampoos, are actually diluted um, prior to placing if you're going to do a semi-open or a closed patch test, or if you're doing a rope test where the patient applies it, they should apply it to their skin twice a day for seven days, but they should use it in the way they would use it. So for example, if they leave the shampoo on five minutes, they can leave that shampoo on their arm five minutes before they wash it off. So this is a semi-open test. This is where we apply the um, uh, product to the skin. Uh, we actually allow the product to dry and then put tape over it so that it stays in place. 
um, this is a specific type of uh, patch testing for products. The repeat open application test is um, the one I was just mentioning. We put a circle on the patient's antecubital fossa. Now we're going to do it two finger breadths, so about an inch away from the antecubital crease because the moisture zone is much higher, so you'll get a difference in absorption. So two finger breadths above would be where we draw a, a quarter size uh, circle, and then they would put that um, the product on there and wash it off. I'm just going to um, uh, also say as part of the management, the rote application test is part of management as well because when they start new products, I want them testing that product on their arm before they put it in an area where they had had a prior um, contact dermatitis. Um, also, once we figure out what they are allergic to, we're going to uh, prescribe avoidance. Now, not just avoidance of the one product that contains it, but avoidance of any other products that might contain that allergen. And that's where the um, contact allergen database comes in. Uh, the contact allergen management program is through the American Contact Dermatitis Society. That has um, something that they are giving free to uh, persons in training, um, and that helps you get a safe shopping list that the patient can actually go to the store, pull up on their phone, and make sure they're getting the right product. There's nothing worse than writing down the name of a product. They go, they get the blue label one, and they were supposed to get the pink label one. They're both called the same brand name, but there's something anti-itch versus uh, hydration therapy. So it's really important the 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 CAMP program actually uh, gives them the exact name, and it's going through an entire restructuring right now to have photos as well. So that's something the American Contact Dermatitis Society has put a huge amount of resources into this year. We're going to use topical and systemic steroids in the acute phase, and if they've gotten a burn from an irritant or if they are um, highly eczematous and they've got Ebola, we would do wound care. So these are the top allergens on the commercially available kit. I would recommend that if you um, are testing with a commercially available kit that you would also add in parallel formaldehyde, balsam of Peru, and methyl isothiazolazone um, on uh, wells next to this test. Um, I would say that about 50% of the formaldehyde and uh, MI reactions are missed by this kit. Um, and when you test in parallel, you actually get a higher rate of detection. Uh, methyl isothiazolazone is being banned in Europe. Um, it, uh, it will likely be banned here sometime in the next five years to ten years. Uh, we're always behind Europe, but it's causing a significant amount of dermatitis for both adults and children, and it can be airborne. It's used in latex paint. It's used in air sprays, um, so it's an important allergen. I just want to show you real quick some cases. This is uh, nickel dermatitis. These are quite straightforward because you can see where the contact is with the allergen. However, sometimes you can get a generalized dermatitis from nickel. Here is an a, a ear piercing reaction, um, but we can also see it um, on the eyelids due to eyelash curlers. I've seen that quite a few times. Remember the dimethylglyoxime test? This is a, uh, a kit that you put drops on the Q-tip. Remember to put the Q-tip on the table and dab the dropper onto the Q-tip. If you try to do it in the air, you can spray it on yourself, which isn't good, and you might not get enough of a drop. And then you rub the, uh, the source metal for 15 seconds to see if it turns pink. I thought I had a picture here. If it turns pink, then you know that uh, the nickel released from that chemical is high. If you're having a generalized dermatitis from nickel, it might be prudent to avoid some of the higher nickel foods uh, to do a trial, such as chocolate, oats, and legumes. It is extraordinarily difficult on a vegetarian vegan diet to avoid nickel because soy um, and um, even the wheat proteins, the glutens that um, are in the for use for protein, uh, will have a high amount of nickel. Balsam of Peru is a, uh, a tree sap that comes from uh, uh, El Salvador. Uh, they named it 
Peru to make sure the Europeans couldn't find the ports uh, where they were bringing it to Europe because it was a very a high commodity at the time. It has um, over 400 chemicals in the sap and different components can be used for different things. Uh, uh, sources of cross reactors to this would be cola, tobacco, chili, tomatoes, citrus, chocolate. These all naturally cross react with balsam of Peru. Fragrance mix is eight different uh, common fragrances. If you um, if you combine balsam of Peru and fragrance mix one, you're going to capture about 70% of people with fragrance allergy. One important point in fragrance allergy is to make sure that uh, you know that unscented is a type of masking fragrance. It is not fragrance free, so it's very, very important to make sure that we explain that to patients. I want to um, show you this neomycin reaction. It's extending beyond the um, suture line. You want to make sure to stop the neomycin at this point. You could use a steroid. I generally don't put a steroid on the wound site itself. I usually do it a centimeter away from the line. Neomycin has been uh, the third most common allergen for many, many years. It is in triple antibiotic ointment. It co-reacts with bacitracin and cross-reacts with other aminoglycosides. Here's an amazing picture. This is actually a patient who um, had thimerosal in their eye drops. We don't see so much thimerosal allergy, even though it is still on the kit. Uh, most of us do not test for it on comprehensive testing. You can be allergic with thimerosal to either the thiosalicylate component or the ethyl mercuric chloride. Um, again, this uh, has been used in vaccines. However, they are generally uh, moving away from this as a preservative. It has a low clinical relevance. Gold is something that we see frequently giving nonspecific reactions on the commercially available kit. Sometimes you will see the reaction under the jewelry. Um, you can um, actually coat the jewelry with rhodium. Or there's some new barrier creams um, that have been shown to be uh, effective um, for nickel and uh, actually help chelate gold. Uh, nickel block is one of them um, and uh, skin tifique makes another one um, and both of those uh, actually are chelation creams. So uh, the person who made the, the skin tifique is a professor from MIT and he was allergic to his wedding ring and his wife told him he could not take it off. So he went back to the lab to figure out what cream. He's, he's not a dermatologist, but he was determined to please his wife because he, she said he couldn't change his ring. So it's kind of a neat story. So he saved his marriage by coming up with a new cream. Sometimes, platinum. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Sometimes we see um, uh, granulomatous reactions uh, when the... Uh, antigen is not able to be removed from the skin. With these, we want to be really careful and make sure that they don't have a mycobacterial re, uh, uh, infection because sometimes those can be injected in the needles as well. So depending on uh, if the reaction is pertaining to one specific color, like this, I generally treat it. If it's crossing color margins, then I will biopsy it. Um, that's just because I don't want to miss a mycobacteria. This is giving information on formaldehyde. Uh, it Remember, it's a preservative. It is in cigarette smoke. It's one of the more difficult ones to uh, get patients to uh, avoid because it's ubiquitous. Uh, I had a patient last week with generalized uh, dermatitis, and he was wearing permanent press clothing. So you look in the label of the clothes, and you're able to tell the patient um, we had the positive patch test. And I said, okay, you've got to go to being wrinkled and 100% cotton. So um, he hasn't come back yet, but um, I, I have a feeling that's his source. Plus, we, he also was sitting on, it was mainly on his trunk, and, he was, and his back was worse than his front, and he did have a leather chair at home. So we've asked him to put a duvet over the leather chair. 
Um, you can also get irritant reactions to formaldehyde and contact urticaria. Remember, it is the chemical in the Brazilian blowout. So you want to make sure anybody allergic to formaldehyde is not going in to get their hair cut where they do that, um, that test. Um, this is talking about the different formaldehyde releasers. Uh, for the interest of time, I'm going to move forward, but I just want to make sure you know all those different names. Quaternium-15 is a specific preservative that releases formaldehyde. It's found in a lot of shampoos, conditioners, moisturizers, and can often give you a hand dermatitis. So this is the question, whoa, sorry, the question here is, is this a positive patch test? So you, this is actually not, this is an irritant reaction, and you can see the cobalt is turning blue in the eccrine ostea. It's actually staining the acrosyringia, and you're getting this eczematous, uh, exudative type, popular look. And this is cobalt. Cobalt is a metal. It co-sensitizes with nickel. Recently, in the last three years, uh, we've seen a lot more cobalt reactions from uh, leather. Uh, we did talk about bacitracin earlier. This is an antibiotic ointment. It co-reacts with um, neomycin, and it can rarely cause a contact urticaria. There's been 23 uh, cases so far of near-death um, near anaphylaxis from topically applied bacitracin. So it is something to think about. Here's a patient who has a textile dermatitis. Um, you can see the irritation, the frictional points have caused an increase in the chemical being absorbed into the skin. Uh, oftentimes, we're going to see patchy generalized dermatitis, but definitely um, where the clothing is tight. It's more often seen in women, and it's often seen where there's blends of fabric. 100% uh, cotton is less likely than something that has a polyester cotton blend. Um, the dyes, the formaldehyde resins, and the permanent press uh, chemicals can uh, specifically be allergens. Uh, remember, rayon and corduroy contain formaldehyde, so we want to avoid those in formaldehyde allergic people. Corticosteroid reactions are real. Um, the first uh, case of corticosteroid allergy was in 1958, and corticosteroids began, began being uh, used nationally on a, on a grand scale in 1954, so four years after we saw allergy to this. Um, it's important to know the structural classes so that you can uh, try a different structural class um, and, and it, it, they're not going to be usually allergic to all, however, some reports in the literature have shown multiple um, allergies, but that's not due to cross-reactivity. That is used due to frequency of use of different ones. Uh, hydrocortisone class A and D will cross-react, and budesonide, which is in class B, has a side arm that can also cross-react. Class C um, is uh, specifically different, and that's the one most of us go to when we are trying to um, uh, avoid uh, uh, cross-reactivity with the corticosteroids. This is a, a baboon dermatitis. This is a, um, a, a reaction where they've ingested a chemical. It's come out the other end and caused a, uh, a diffuse response um, peri, um, perigluially. This is an airborne contact. I see this a lot with our plants, our parthenolide group, which would be our daisy, dandelion, um, uh, um, a feverfew type plants. Um, we do see that. Ragweed is also in that uh, group. Uh, sesquiterpene lactone is the allergen. This is another uh, plant dermatitis. This is a phytophoto. Often we see this in bartenders who are squeezing limes. There'll be a, a linearity and a, and a bronzing type reaction seen here. Um, I wanted to mention this because we do see contact urticaria in food handlers and atopics. Celery, uh, the umbellifers, um, has been reported, and it's actually the leaves of the, uh, the celery. And then tree nuts have also been associated with anaphylactic response. Um, you guys actually know way more about that than I do, but I wanted to bring it up. So this is, um, the question here is what type of reaction is this? So we see this um, uh, uh, thorn type hair. 
and this will cause a can cause a toxin mediated contact urticaria from the trichomes and this is from nettles you can also get mechanical irritant dermatitis um, from the spines on uh, uh, cacti these are the top families that cause irritant contact dermatitis. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to read them all, but what I've how I've char characterized these is the, the group, the kinds of um, uh, plants that go in there, for example, radish and garlic, and then the irritant uh, and where the irritant is located. So for this one, it's the bulb. This one is actually in the, um, the leaf. This is dumb cane. This is actually a house plant that people like because it's hard to kill. Um, but it does have calcium oxalate uh, both in the bulb and on the leaves. So you have to be aware of this. Um, this is a linear reaction seen with phytophotodermatitis. Again, another uh, linear reaction. I wanted to talk about allergens. Uh, the furocumarins um, are the ones that can cause in the bartenders the lime. We also can see this with celeries. In terms of plant families, we've got the parsnip family, the lemon lime family, which is the rutaceae, and also the um, moratia, which is your mulberry family. Here this is poison ivy. Um, you can see the linearity is highly specific and poison oak. This is the toxicodendron family. Uh, so ivy, oak, and sumac are all going to have your toxicodendron. They're all in the toxicodendron family, and they have your shile as the allergen. If you look carefully, you'll see these little black dots on the leaves. That is, called, um, that is from the resin of the uh, urushiol uh, hardening in the sun, but we also will see that same reaction on patients. It's called black dot dermatitis. So you'll actually see the black spots on the leaf and you'll see black spots in the middle of their eczema. The cross reactors, this is another mnemonic calamari with ginger and pepper, and this just goes through all the different um, allergens that cross react, uh, all the different families that cross react with the poison ivy family from cashew, um, nut oil to mango rind to um, the ginkgo tree. Alstroemeria is a significant um, allergen that we see in florists. Uh, this is the of uh, there's only one plant family in the world that has more species than Asteracea. Asteracea is your chrysanthemum, ragweed, daisy. Uh, the plant family that has the most uh, diversity is actually the orchids, but we don't see reactions to the orchids uh, as much as those. Primrose is, and buttercups can also cause an irritant and an allergic. So what we did here was just separated the different most common irritant versus plant uh, irritant versus allergic contact dermatitis from plants. And then these are just some extra slides um, that I had developed when I was teaching the patch test training uh, course uh, for you to go through um, at your leisure. This is the black dot dermatitis. And then there's some test questions at the end if you'd like to practice those as well. Did anybody have any questions for me? I just wanted to make sure you had more. And don't do this at home. Oh, Agabi. Oh, there you go. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Wow. This is uh, <clears throat> kind of overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's a lot to learn. And um, if we're going to really get into contact dermatitis, it takes a lot of study and a lot of practice. And uh, we really appreciate the, uh, the overview. I, I did have one patient. Uh, who had a con had a reaction on a true test to gold, and it didn't react until about seven days later, and then the reaction went on for three or four weeks. Have you heard of that? Yes. So that is your non. Remember, gold is an immune uh, activator. We uh, it changes your immune system. So we actually use gold to treat um, RA and some other things. So what happens is the gold gets sequestered in the skin and actually causes a nonspecific response, but because it's not getting mobilized and moved out of the skin, it can come up even three months later. Wow. 
And but what I would do in that case is I would inject the patch test site. And I do inject quite a lot of patch test sites. Anything over a 2.0. Two 2 plus or more, I inject with 2 mix per cc catalog, uh, just uh, 100 microliters right into the middle of the patch test because that helps uh, stop the continued cloning of cells in the skin so you don't get an extended uh, relief and an extended source while you're trying to avoid. And does it eventually go away on its own if you just leave it or does it take uh, you to treat it? So I have had one that actually became colloidal from gold. Wow. Right. Any other okay. any questions? We had, we had to cut that one out because yeah. the, the patient didn't clear the gold. So early on I was not wanting to inject because I was like, okay, I want to see, you know, make sure that I don't misread a reaction. But if I've got a two plus on a Wednesday, sometimes I'll even inject um, like 50 microliters right into the middle because if it becomes overwhelming, it swells up and, and expands into the other wells and then I can't see those wells. Uh, yep, makes it confusing. Okay, well, comprehensive and complete as always and kind of overwhelming for us who are just learning, but um, we really appreciate this overview that you've, you've given us. Uh, so thank you so much for, uh, for this discussion today.